As a general, you've faced a number of different enemies, the Germans, uh, the uh, North Koreans, and the North Vietnamese. How do, you, how do the North Vietnamese stack up as enemies? Civilization has never seen uh, a tougher fighter than the North Vietnamese soldier. He was well indoctrinated by the uh, communist propaganda that was fed him continuously. As a matter of fact, uh, more time was devoted to propaganda than to military training. But he was tough physically, he was uh, resourceful, and he didn't mind to die. He uh, was imbued with the fact that uh, the greatest uh, honor that could come to him was to die on the field of battle. Many of the North Vietnamese that came from the north to the south uh, via the Ho Chi Minh Trail had uh, tattooed on their arm in Vietnamese a slogan, born in the north to die in the south. Uh, this individual uh, was uh, very cunning. He had been well schooled in guerrilla tactics. On the other hand, uh, those North Vietnamese soldiers first thrown into combat uh, were quite reckless and they took unnecessary casualties because of this fact. I believe the individual uh, North Vietnamese soldier was far better than his leadership. Well, you've had a number of allies too in the, in the wars that you've known. You've had the British and the French and you've had the South Koreans and you've had the South Vietnamese. How do the South Vietnamese stack up as, as allied soldiers? The individual South Vietnamese soldier is an excellent soldier. The problem in South Vietnam for many, many years was leadership. Uh, soldiers uh, throughout the world and throughout history have been as good or as bad as their leadership. There's a direct relationship between the performance of a, of a soldier and the leadership that he has. During the early days of the Vietnam War, the 64 uh, and prior to our major involvement, uh, 64 and then in 65 and thereafter, uh, the leadership in the South, Vietnam, South Vietnamese Army was marginal. But uh, over a period of time it improved and by 67 the leadership was beginning to emerge and it continued to emerge uh, during the ensuing years. The uh, North Vietnamese soldier was, uh, I would say, uh, better disposed uh, for that type of war than either the American soldier or the South Vietnamese soldier. The South Vietnamese soldier was confused at the beginning by the political chaos that existed. Uh, he also was influenced by some very marginal leaders uh, during the early days of the war. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the South Vietnamese soldier, when provided with the proper leadership, wasn't afraid to die and sacrifice his life for the principles that his government was fighting for, namely to keep South Vietnam from being taken over through the use of military forces by North Vietnam. Now, the American soldier, of course, I think he's uh, as good as any soldier in history, but he's never been through such a traumatic experience as was the case during Vietnam. Of course, I'm biased when I talk about the American soldier because I have great admiration for him. The American soldier in Vietnam was very brave on the field of battle and very compassionate in dealing with the Vietnamese people. One of the things that hurt me most during the course of my involvement was the uh, revelation of, uh, of the My Lai incident, which I can assure you was definitely uh, an aberration. The American soldier was very good in dealing with the Vietnamese peasant. Showed great compassion on the battlefield. On the other hand, he was brave in fighting the enemy. During the early days of the war, the American soldier had very high esprit de corps and, and excellent morale. But after a few years had gone by and the uh, anti-war forces in our country uh, started doing their thing and the sweethearts and the wives and the mothers and fathers started sending clippings to them and writing letters questioning the morality of the war and uh, accepting uh, some of the anti-war philosophy.
uh, it had an impact on the morale of the troops. It's amazing that it didn't have not have more. Where does the buck stop with an incident like Mili or when there are widespread civilian deaths? Well, there were civilian deaths, uh, quite obviously, at uh, Mili. There were civilian deaths uh, involved in uh, indiscriminate use of fire uh, from time to time, despite the fact that there were orders to the contrary. But uh, I would say most of the civilian casualties were from accidents. A, a bomb would be off target. Uh, the wrong data would be set on the sites of an artillery piece. I would say under an environment of that type, where you have so many things that can go wrong, you've got so many people that are involved throughout the chain of command, uh, strong discipline is the only answer. Uh, plus, and this is very important, very strong and dedicated officers. Officers who understand the regulations, who understand the standards, and who assure that the troops adhere to that, those standards and a uh, very high level of discipline. Uh, in the case of My Lai, uh, the chain of command broke down. Uh, however, you must realize that this was uh, the only case where it broke down to that degree. And the brigade involved in this incident was the last brigade to arrive, which arrived in the latter part of 1967, and which had not completed its training uh, before it came, came to Vietnam. However, uh, fundamentals such as uh, the care that you give to prisoners, the way they're treated in accordance with the Geneva Conventions, uh, the wars, of, uh, the laws of war, uh, are given to every soldier and every officer during the course of basic training, and this is uh, very fundamental stuff. How did you personally feel when you heard about this? That well, it wasn't true. I was unbelieving. I was uh, totally unbelieving. I didn't see how it could happen in view of the the emphasis that had been put on things of that type. Uh, not only in orders, but in command conferences and things of this type. I couldn't conceive of American soldiers uh, 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 killing uh, uh, helpless civilians. I just couldn't conceive of it. What about the uh, body count uh, emphasis uh, that was made by, I suppose, both the military and the press during the, the war? What, got, what started all that? And doesn't something like that tend to lead in the direction of civilian... Well, this all started back in the 1963-64 time frame, where the South Vietnamese were claiming that they'd killed great numbers of enemy on the battlefield. Uh, the press questioned this. They questioned it strongly. In order to try to enhance the credibility of the South Vietnamese, it was uh, decided that uh, the American advisors would attempt to verify the accuracy of the reports by the Vietnamese commanders. And the only way they could do that was to make a surveillance of the battlefield to determine actually how many enemy had been killed. In other words, uh, count the bodies. Now, this term has always been repugnant to me, but this uh, became the terminology that was prevalent in Vietnam, uh, namely body count. It was always repugnant, but it was a uh, practice that was started in order to uh, have more credibility with the press. Uh, and frankly, in retrospect, I don't know what else could have been done. I think the press uh, did quite a remarkable job in reporting the war, although I don't want to give the impression that I felt it was always objective. I think many of the young reporters who were serving an apprenticeship uh, were trying to win Pulitzer Prizes and make the headlines or the, the byline on the first page, and therefore they were looking for the sensational. But after all, the sensational is news in our country. But this was a new experience uh, for the military and a new experience for our country to fight a war uh, without any uh, restraint uh, by the press. Did the home front let you down? I can't pass judgment on that. I mean, after all, uh, one of the great strengths of our country is the open society we have. Uh, 
I think the press uh, may make a great contribution uh, to our society and to the maintenance of the democracy, which is ours. This is the first time, however, we've ever had uh, free and open reporting on the battlefield. Uh, I've frequently wondered what would have happened if we had fought World War II under those conditions. I'm not sure we would have won it. What about your strategy? Uh, can you tell us what was your strategy during well, the Well, this war? was a limited war fought for limited objectives with limited means. Uh, we were not allowed uh, to expand the war, and uh, the Commander-in-Chief made that very clear at the beginning, that uh, it was not our intention to expand the war. We therefore uh, were forced uh, militarily to, to be on the strategic defensive. We couldn't attack across the demilitarized zone or make an amphibious hook in order to cut off those forces uh, north of the demilitarized zone in the Benhai River. We couldn't go at, and, uh, during that time frame into Laos and into Cambodia with any uh, sizable forces. By virtue of the constraints that were imposed upon us, we were forced, uh, we the military, to uh, fighting a war of attrition. In other words, when the enemy presented himself on the battlefield in South Vietnam, we could destroy him. But we couldn't pursue him. We couldn't uh, uh, go into his uh, sanctuaries that were uh, uh, across the demilitarized zone or across international uh, boundaries. The strategy I suppose could be summarized as follows, uh, at least the initial strategy starting in 1965, to hurt the enemy uh, through military forces utilizing bombing of the north and putting pressure on the enemy's uh, insurgency structure in the south uh, to the point where the enemy would agree to negotiate. Now it became very clear to me in, this, in 1967 that this was not a viable strategy. It was at that, at that time that I strongly urged and recommended that we put more effort into expanding the Vietnamese forces, encouraging them to go to mobilization of manpower, give them modern arms, so that we could project a takeover by them of all the battlefield responsibilities in due time. Uh, this was a strategy that uh, finally prevailed, but it, the strategy was encouraged by the enemy's Tet Offensive uh, by virtue of his very heavy losses. And it was uh, further uh, encouraged and accelerated uh, by the actions of President Nixon and in going into the sanctuaries in the 70-71 uh, time frame. Whose was the original strategy that you decided was ineffective in 1967? Well, that was the strategy of the administration at the time, and it was designed to uh, reduce the number of ground forces uh, to be deployed. But it wasn't a viable strategy. The main uh, effort in accordance with the strategy was the bombing of the North. But the enemy reacted uh, from this bombing by sending more troops to the south. And this required us to uh, introduce more troops into the south ourselves in order to keep South Vietnam from being overrun. Does what you just said about the bombing uh, and how it, it encouraged a greater uh, infiltration rate on the part of the North Vietnamese indicate that you now agree with those who criticized the bombing as being ineffective? Uh, not necessarily. I felt that uh, that was about the only action we had open to us at the time was to initiate the bombing because the enemy was sending uh, forces down in large numbers to include regular North Vietnamese troops at the time. And there was uh, a chance that the enemy would have uh, read a resolve by the American people based on the bombing that we were not going to abandon the effort and it was uh, going to be, in the final analysis, a uh, losing cause uh, for uh, North Vietnam. Well, now, North Vietnam didn't act that way, but uh, there, there was a, a feeling and a hope uh, that they would.
Now, when uh, the enemy moved uh, forces down, uh, they had to be countered. Uh, the bombing, of course, was constrained. Uh, the uh, harbors were not mined. Some of the more lucrative targets were not hit. And if the bombing had been used uh, more effectively and in greater mass, it could have succeeded. Now, there's another angle to this that I think many people have forgotten, namely that the bombing had quite a salutary effect in South Vietnam. And the people in South Vietnam uh, during that time frame were quite discouraged. They uh, felt that they, uh, their cause was perhaps hopeless. And when we started the bombing, it suggested to the South Vietnamese that we were with them and that we were going to commit whatever forces necessary. And this had a stabilizing political influence. Uh, in South Vietnam. It raised their morale. What were uh, some of the new weapons that your forces had in this war that you wouldn't have had in previous wars? Well, I would say the helicopter is perhaps uh, the most significant. Of course, the B-52, strategic bombing, uh, bombers used in a tactical role uh, uh, was also an innovation. The CBU was uh, a new weapon, which uh, brought about uh, greater fragmentation. The idea was to cover a greater area. They were developed uh, by the Army, the Air Force, and the Navy. All the services uh, have them in order to try to uh, develop a weapon with greater lethality that would uh, save lives on our battlefield, American lives, by having a material advantage over the enemy. And this is what war is all about. No. What is the purpose of the electronic battlefield or the automated battlefield? During the course of the Vietnam War, one of the innovations, which I didn't mention before, was the, the sensor. Uh, these were developed at a great expense. Uh, Mr. McNamara took great interest uh, in this development and, and totally financed it. And we had some uh, rather good results with it. What do you mean by sensors? What did the sensors do? Sensors de determine uh, movement. Uh, movement of trucks, a movement of, uh, of individuals. Some were seismic and some were acoustical. And what happens after the sensors are activated? When the sensors are activated, uh, the, they go into uh, a, a control center uh, where uh, the information uh, can be reduced uh, by the, uh, through the use of computers. And once the intelligence has been acquired in this fashion, uh, the thought is that this be transmitted to uh, artillery or to, to uh, air units that could immediately respond and bring firepower to bear. When the firepower is brought to bear, isn't it uh, awfully difficult to distinguish between farmers walking down a trail and a troop of soldiers? Well, of course, in most battlefields, you, you know where the enemy is and you know where, uh, where our troops, uh, needless to say, are. Uh, in a counterinsurgency environment, uh, you do have uh, the problem of differentiating uh, between civilians and, and military. The automated battlefield was not necessarily visualized as being uh, totally applicable uh, on a battlefield uh, where you had uh, civilians, uh, in other words, fighting in and among civilian population. I never visualized it uh, in that context. Let, let me uh, just point out that the commanders in Vietnam were very, very sensitive to civilian casualties. I, I don't know how we could have been more sensitive don't know how we could have continued to fight a war uh, in the environment uh, which we, uh, we, we uh, were given and have uh, taken greater steps to, to avoid uh, civilian casualties. We had them, yes. Uh, most of them uh, were uh, a result of accidents, but they were, it was bad judgment, it was indiscretion. There's no question about that. All of these things happened, but uh, we were dealing with a human machine. And uh, we were fighting that war very much on a decentralized basis. In the final analysis, sometimes it came down to the, the good judgment of, 
of some young officer down at the end of the line. And in most cases, I think those young officers acted with great discretion. The problem of the infantrymen in the field was, uh, was, was difficult. Uh, no, no American fighting man uh, in the history before has had to use uh, such a judgment uh, as he uh, performed in the field or carried out his tactical mission. For that reason, the uh, American infantryman had to be, uh, or should have been, a highly intelligent individual because he could not uh, operate by rote. Uh, he, had to, he had to use his, his judgment and his intelligence. <coughs> me. And some of our more intelligent young men, of course, uh, uh, were, uh, were on the college campuses uh, by virtue of uh, the educational deferments, which was a policy of our country. And I'm not objecting to that. I'm merely pointing out that uh, that, uh, we'd, that some of the uh, more intelligent people that we had in other wars uh, were, were not uh, involved to the same degree in this. Now, I'm not suggesting that our infantrymen were, were not intelligent, they, but they varied as a cross-section of our country. Given the sensitivity of <clears throat> you and the other commanders, General Abrams and General Harkins before you, to civilian deaths, how does it happen that the Senate subcommittee, for instance, on refugees uh, comes out with figures over a million uh, in terms of civilian casualties. I don't believe those uh, figures that have been banded around have ever been supported by fact. Uh, when I was uh, in, in the Pentagon and we heard those figures, we could never substantiate them. I don't know where they came from. I, I can't, uh, I, I can't uh, support uh, or deny those figures. But uh, you know, the war has gone on a long time, and uh, of course, casualties were created not only by uh, accidents and by indiscretion of our troops, which happened from time to time, out of the Vietnamese, but by mines and booby traps, many of which were put in by the enemy. Uh, uh, in other words, that was a hazardous environment. But I will say this, without any question based on the knowledge I have, uh, the comments on civilian casualties have been used in the United States for political purposes and have been greatly exaggerated. What about the strategy of, of uh, creating refugees? Uh, yes, there were many refugees created uh, by displacing civilian population. Well, this was done uh, by the South Vietnamese government, and uh, on some occasions we would recommend this to the South Vietnamese government. The areas involved would be remote areas uh, where the uh, enemy was preying off of this local population. They were providing porters who were being forced into service. Uh, they were getting rice uh, from the people, and the people were being required to cultivate rice fields and uh, manioc fields in order to feed uh, the uh, enemy troops. By displacing the population to a safe area, it was for the purpose of protecting those peasants, but also denying their labor and their services to the enemy. Now, normally, before they were displaced, but not always, a refugee camp uh, would be prepared. And uh, they would move into this camp uh, where they would actually be provided for and would be safer than they would be to uh, remain in the insecure area uh, where they could be exploited uh, by the enemy. So this was not an inhumane action by the South Vietnamese. Uh, I would say, in general, it was a, a humane action. But of course, uh, sometimes the peasants were, were not happy about this uh, in that uh, they were uh, very much uh, attached to the soil which provided uh, their livelihood and where their ancestors were buried. But all of this displacement uh, was uh, hoped to be temporary. It was uh, hoped uh, by the South Vietnamese government that our military forces would be able to secure the area from whence they were evacuated and they could go back to their lands and to the graves of their ancestors. What would be the difference in their lives if we had never gone to Vietnam? 
I would assume that'd be under uh, communist domination. Now, I'm in no position to, to uh, contrast the life that they would have under a communist regime to that that they have now. I leave that up to the political scientists. And after all, my role was that of a soldier, not as a political scientist. Well, do you have a personal understanding of the communist threat? What does it mean personally to you? Well, uh, here again, uh, this, is a, this is a political question. And this, this was decided uh, back in 1964 by President Eisenhower. Our commitment to the South Vietnamese uh, was endorsed by President Kennedy and uh, again by President Johnson and President Nixon. This was a major tra strategy decision that we should uh, hold the line in, in South Vietnam. And it was felt at that time that all of Southeast Asia was in jeopardy of falling into the communist camp. Now, this, is a, this was the, the rationale at the time. Uh, history will have to pass judgment on whether this was uh, an accurate judgment. I cannot do it. 